Sure. Okay. Um, hello, uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. As always, we welcome our friend and colleague from all over the world. I know our, our friend Yoshi, the 11 p.m., still in his office with the beer. That's such a great time to enjoy the late evening talk. And uh, <clears throat> many of our friends from China and some friends in the U.S. and Europe. And so Europe is Friday afternoon, I guess uh, nobody, is everybody should be in the bar, but now it's uh, at home, maybe drink a beer and wine, right? So, uh, but uh, today uh, we are so happy to get Professor Serge Benet uh, talk about uh, the Rhine River Delta system in the Mediterranean Sea, all the way from the shoreline to the deep sea. So this is the source to think webinar series 32, 32. Uh, so this is also live streamed to the YouTube channel and recorded on the YouTube channel over there. <coughs> so uh, um, Serge um, is a marine geologist, uh, is a famous, we know, seismic stratigraphy and sedimentology. He worked from 1976 to 2008, I think almost uh, how many years? Gosh, oh, 40 years of, in Ephemale. Uh, French Marine Institute in Bristol. And also, I have also personal <laughs> interaction with uh, Professor Serge Benet, and we meet in early 1996 when I was a graduate student in Hong Kong. And back 2003, he invited me to visit IFMEL about one month. And that was the first time I visited uh, a French. I just love the country, I love the food, I love the culture. It's a great. And so um, now he retired and uh, he, he moved to the uh, Pepillon, University of Pepillon in 2008 and had a professor position uh, after under 10 years. Now he's retired, but still participated in research crews and research project. And he has uh, working on the tidal dominant environment and the subaqueous uh, dunes sand wave system around the Europe and Asia marginal sea. And so uh, also most recently he shifted to study the, the uh, climate and the sea level change, the imprint on the stratigraphy, architecture, second stratigraphy on the continent margin. And he was also, uh, said also was one of the coordinators of the Euro, Europe US, Euro US Stratform project. Uh, so uh, he has been working around most of the oceans, uh, including Southern Ocean, and now mainly focus on Gulf of Lyon in the Western Mediterranean Sea. And this is somehow the talk today, I guess he will give a little bit of review, overview, and we needed to know this river system all the way from the, the shoreline to the deep sea in the part of uh, this very important talk in the, this whole webinar series, source series. So uh, I think, uh, uh, Serge, now is your turn. Please share your screen and the part. Okay. Ah, uh, we made it. Yeah, now it looks very good. <laughs> okay, sorry again. So thank you for the, th thank you for the introduction, uh, Paul. Uh, I have to, okay, I have to come back to my, do you see my, uh, my pointer when I move? Yes. Okay. Just click. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, the, the, the objectives of this talk are, are to present you, uh, the, the state of the art, what we know on the own system. It's not a, a presentation of my, uh, own work only. As you can imagine, it's. Uh, I tried to. It was a pretty nice exercise, in fact, because I tried to to review uh, everything, including uh, all things uh, that we did that that I did not remember, and uh, and I tried also in the in the spirit of a, of a source uh, to think project uh, to mix uh, the the classical uh, sedimentological and stratigraphic approach and uh, what we know about the, the modern uh, processes. And I did that from the deep sea to the, to the coastline. 
because in fact, the Roso is a nice uh, acronym for Ron from source to sing. But as you said, uh, Paul, uh, I'm only going to talk about the, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the subaqueous system of a Ron. So I'm not going to read all of these names that you have here, it just to, to remind you that this has been a, a work during the last 25 years. So it involved quite a lot of uh, PhD students and colleagues, especially uh, colleagues uh, at Ifremer, where, where I spent uh, many years. So I'm sure I forgot many of them, but I wanted to, to, to have the name of some of them uh, listed here. So you, you are probably familiar with this map of a, of a large uh, deep sea funds around the world. And in fact, uh, we had uh, talks about many of these systems already. And uh, what I am going to talk today is something relatively small compared to this uh, huge uh, system. But let's say it's at the scale of a, of a Mediterranean Sea, uh, which is relatively small or Europe, which is very small compared to Asia or America anyway. Uh, this is where we have been able to focus on our work. In a way, it's easier because the size are smaller. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, the, the two main uh, contributors to the, in terms of fresh water uh, and in terms of sediment as well uh, in the Mediterranean Sea are the Rhone and the Nile, the Nile being the, for many, for a long time, for most of the geological time, uh, the Nile has been number one. And it's only in the recent years, I think, that the Rhone became, in terms of uh, freshwater supply, the number one provider to the, to the Mediterranean Sea. So I'm not going to talk about the, the Nile because you had uh, some weeks ago already a, a nice presentation from Yuri Shatter. So we focus on the we focus on the on the Rhone. So the Rhone system is <clears throat> is uh, the Rhone fan. At least you can see here on this map uh, goes down to the to the Sardinia uh, uh, coastline, and this is the, the abyssal plain here, which is around the three thousand meter water depth. If we look at the present day system. It's a relatively small system. This, uh, the surface is in the order of uh, 100,000 square kilometers, which is about the size of the of a Bengal Delta Plain, if I remember, if I remember well, uh, uh, some weeks ago. Uh, and the, the contribution, the present day contribution of the Rhone is uh, presently in the order of seven or eight million tons uh, per year, but we know it was uh, four to five times more uh, before the, the damming of the Rhone, which took place mainly uh, during the 50s and the 60s. <clears throat> what you see here represent the, the glacial uh, coverage of the Alps uh, during the last glacial maximum uh, and the, the Rhone, the, the characteristic of the Rhone is that it's, uh, it's uh, under the influence both of, uh, of uh, oceanic climate and also of uh, mountainous uh, glaciers, uh, which covered uh, the Alps uh, regularly during each of the glacial periods of at least of a, during the Quaternary. So, it contrasts very strongly with small uh, streams from the Western Gulf of Lyon, uh, which are typical uh, Mediterranean uh, rivers, which are dominated by flash floods. But nevertheless, most of the contribution, about 90% of the contribution in terms of sediment is from the Rhone. So this is a, a shaded uh, bathymetric map of uh, of a shelf and slope and uh, the upper part of the deep basin. So we can identify different uh, morphological domains with the delta plain, the subacruz delta, the modern, less than uh, 10,000 years uh, subacruz delta. 
and what Chuck Nitroer calls uh, Sebaco's delta, and not only Chuck Nitroer, but many others, which are sediment advected, advected from the, from the Rhone and transported by longshore current uh, all along the coastline, and not only along the coastline, we, we see, we'll see that later on. And then we have these uh, offshore sand, which are the relic sand, which have been described on most of the continental shells around the world, uh, mainly inherited uh, from the last uh, glacial period. We can identify on these maps the, the retreat path of the river systems. We have a beautiful uh, network of canyons, and we will look at that in more detail. And then we have two major sediment bodies. One is the Rhone deep sea fan per se, and another one is not so well known, but it's a pretty nice accumulation of uh, relatively fine grained sediment based on what we know from the upper part, uh, which is remodeled by uh, large, large means two to three kilometers in, in width, uh, sediment waves. So, not going into the details, uh, what is important for our studies is that the, the Gulf of Lyon is a, is a recent margin. It uh, started opening uh, about 30 million years. So the rifting and, the, and the, the rotation of the Corsican Sardinia block took place between 30 and 20 million years ago, which means creating this, uh, this open space here uh, which means that this is a young margin uh, with pretty high um, subsidence rate, which implies a lot of accommodation for all of these uh, sediments from the Rhone uh, to be accommodated uh, on the shelf and, uh, and on the margin. It contrasts strongly, for instance, with the Atlantic uh, coast where the subsidence rate is much lower. And another uh, event that we have to take into account for understanding, uh, understanding sedimentation in, in this part of the world is uh, the well-known uh, Messinian uh, salinity crisis uh, related to the closure of the uh, Gibraltar Strait around uh, 6 million years ago, which led to the, to the thick deposition, the deposition of thick evaporites in the, in the deep basin and to the entrenchment of, uh, of the rivers, especially the, the Rhone and the Nile, uh, which have been uh, deeply uh, carving uh, their, uh, their stream in response to this uh, lowering of sea level, which was in the order of uh, 1800 meters. Uh, something amazing, in fact, uh, if, if you have a historical view, is that two people, uh, two men made a, about the same discovery in the same time. One was a Russian fellow working on the Aswan Dam on, along the Nile. And the other one was a, a geographer uh, named uh, Georges Clauson in France. And the two of them, they observed this very deeply incised valley, uh, very far upstream uh, in Aswan, in the case of Shumachov, and in Lyon, the city of Lyon, uh, which must be somewhere here on this uh, paleogeographic map. And these two guys came to the conclusion that uh, something happened during the Messinian and they explained, they were the first to explain, uh, the, to propose the, this uh, major drawdown of sea level, uh, which was very controversial at the time. And this was confirmed uh, later by the uh, DSDP, expedition with by Ken Shu and uh, Bill Ryan and others. Well, that's a nice uh, story that I like to tell. So this is the, this is the Rhone deep sea fan in, in a cross section here. And this is a thickness map and you see this pretty strange uh, depot center. In fact, this is related to the, mainly to the salt tectonics. Because as I told you, uh, there is a, there is a thick pile of uh, evaporite uh, covering the entire basin, uh, deep water part of the, of the basin. <clears throat> and this will have an impact on the, on the morphologies that we are going to look. Both the erosion surface on the shelves 
and uh, the salt tectonics in the deep basin. So if we have a quick look at the, at the physical processes, the, the modern processes, uh, it's quite uh, the same scenario as everywhere in the Mediterranean Sea with this uh, anti-clockwise uh, circulation, which is uh, typical, which is uh, pretty well described nowadays. Uh, with this uh, stratif stratification here, which is changing according to, to the seasons. And uh, this is, for instance, the Levantine intermediate water, which comes from the Eastern uh, Mediterranean Sea. We, we heard about this when we looked at the sediment waves along the, the Nile margin. Um, something important in that part of the Mediterranean Sea is here where we have one of the main zone of deep water formations in the, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is due to strong winds, which especially in the winter are favoring evaporation and formation of dense water, which is plunging approximately in this area of a deep, uh, Rhone deep siphon. And you have also processes along the margin, cascades uh, of cold water, which take place episodically uh, during the winter time. If you look at the shelf, um, at the shelf uh, processes in particular, uh, it happened that uh, the Western Gulf of Lyon here is the place where you have the most important, uh, the, the strongest physical processes. Uh, and uh, especially uh, if you see at the, let's say this, this could be considered as the outlet of a, of a, of a Gulf of Lyon, you see the, a strong uh, amplification of uh, near bed uh, current during winter, not, not, not necessarily winter, during surface uh, storms, uh, storms which are generated uh, by surface winds flowing in that direction. From the, from the surface, and it creates near the seafloor uh, an anti-clockwise circulation, which is at maximum here uh, at the outlet of the Gulf of Lions. And the other phenomenon is in winter, when you have uh, these uh, cascades uh, that I mentioned previously, and these cascades, they are particularly important also in the western part of the Gulf of Lyon. You can see there is a cold in green water, which is episodically uh, plunging along the slope uh, during episodes of uh, strong northwest wind, wind blowing from the northwest. So even though the, the Gulf of Lyon is viewed as a relatively low energy uh, shelf compared to tidal seas, for instance, there are some pretty active processes, especially in the Western part of this, uh, of this area. So now look at, the, look at the margin architecture now at different uh, geometrical and time scales. And this is based, what I'm going to show you very quickly is based on, uh, is based on uh, more than 20 years of uh, seismic data and core uh, covering operations and also uh, drilling operation uh, during this uh, European uh, funded project called PROMESS some years ago. And to start with, this is a, a deep penetration seismic across, uh, across the shelf uh, along this, uh, this red line here, uh, where you can see the the rifting, the formation of this uh, sedimentary basin, which are several kilometers in thick. In fact, in fact, there were some uh, prospect for from the oil industry in, in the 70s, and this is why we have pretty nice uh, uh, seismic data in that area. And you can even, at the first look, uh, recognize this surface here, which is the erosion surface during the sea level drawdown of the, of the Messinian crisis. So let's have a look at a higher frequency, higher resolution scale here. 
And this is a common channel, multi-channel seismic uh, acquired by the oil industry, by Total. And you can see these beautiful uh, clinoforms, uh, more than one kilometer uh, high. And uh, in detail, uh, they are uh, remodeled by sediment waves. All of them are made of sediment waves uh, climbing upward as observed on many other uh, continental uh, margins around the world. And what is interesting here, and this is the, this is the, the Messinian erosion surface as probably you, you figured out. And you can see in fact, how a margin rebuilt after a major phase of erosion. And in fact, it took about 5 million years for the margin to, to rebuild after the erosion of, uh, of um, during the Messinian salinity crisis. And more precisely, uh, this is from a recent work by uh, uh, Céline Rousseau. You can see isopac map here, where you can see the first phase of the Pliocene, which is called the Zonclean, uh, we, where you see that the depot center are uh, uh, located on the inner shelf of the, of the Gulf of Lyon. This is the present day uh, shelf edge here. And you see that by the end of the, of the Pliocene, during the Pleasantian, uh, the, the margin reach more or less the present day position of this margin. And uh, let's go again into more details now at higher frequencies and higher time and space resolution. So this is multi-channel seismic uh, from the same area. This is not exactly the same profile, same position, but not very far. And we will focus on many slides on, on this area. And you can see these surfaces, all of these surfaces, which are erosion surfaces, which are becoming correlative conformities uh, on, the, on the upper slope. And this is where we did the, the deep uh, promise borehole here, and we reach uh, stage marine isotope stage uh, 13, which is uh, a bit more than 500,000 years, uh, year BP before present. So it gives you an idea about the, the, the sedimentation rate uh, on this uh, part of the margin. And this is exactly the same profile with a higher uh, resolution system with, uh, with a sparker system. So you don't see very much detail because of the resolution of the screen. So I have to, to show you a close up view at the position of a second borehole here. And you see on this, uh, on this slide, you see the, this beautiful clinoform, but we are looking at a different kind of clinoform. Now we are looking at clinoforms in the, in the order of 20 to 30 meters between four, five degrees uh, of slope. And they are made, we, we, we got pretty good recovery. We, we use the push sampling technology. So we got pretty good uh, recovery in this uh, difficult uh, sedimentary environment. And the upper 10, 20 meters are almost 100% made of sand. I, I chose a, a slide with some clay or silty layers because it's more beautiful, but in fact, it's mainly clay, uh, mainly sand, sorry, uh, in the first uh, 15 upper meters. Then when you get lower, you see these beautiful uh, laminated beds, which are in fact alternating sands and, uh, and silty clay or clay silt. It looks like turbidites, or you could probably also call these uh, tempestites. And in fact, we are in the lower part of a shore face or, uh, or prodeltaic system, uh, which is becoming uh, finer and finer when you, when you move seaward. So this is exactly what we will observe on the present day Rhone system uh, on course. And then each of these uh, major erosion surfaces uh, that we have seen already uh, on, the, on the seismic profiles, they are very heterogeneous. In fact, they are composite surfaces. They are both sequence boundaries and also maximum flooding surfaces. In fact, they are polygenic surfaces of erosion. 
and you find very heterogeneous, heterogeneous material, including uh, pebbles and, uh, and shells and many other things. And then at the very bottom of the borehole, we reach what uh, we consider as the actual incision uh, within a major canyon, which is now buried due to the progradation of a margin. And in this, uh, in this place, we found beautiful, uh, beautiful, I don't see in fact on my screen, I don't see the, this part of the screen. Uh, you can see beautiful cobbles, fluvial cobbles coming from the Western, in fact, uh, the Western part of the Gulf of Lions. Now, this is the ultimate uh, resolution that we, we may obtain so far. This is use, using a, a chirp system. Uh, this guy here, this is a beach rock, cemented sands. Uh, but what you can see is the upper part of these uh, clinoforms. There's not so much penetration in, in sand. You get better uh, penetration when you, when you move seaward and you are again in finer grain sediments. And uh, what is interesting is that you have plenty of these bed forms, which in fact are real bed forms. Uh, when you look at pretty high quality swath bathymetric data, you can see that in fact, here are again these uh, beach rocks here and there. And you can see that there is a, a hierarchy of, uh, of bed forms, which includes these elongated features that we interpret as transgressive sand ridge. When I say transgressive, I mean sand ridge that formed at the, during the early stage of a sea level rise, uh, right after the last glacial maximum. And on top of them, we find these dunes that you see very nicely here. We'll see them, in fact, in many other places. And these are bed forms which are in equilibrium in present day processes. And when I say present day processes, I don't mean average present day processes. I mean the storms, uh, the storm, the, north, the southeast winds generating this wind driven circulation. And what you have here is the shear stress on the seafloor, which has been modeled uh, and where this is approximately the, the place uh, that I'm showing to you right now. And you see that there are some places here where this, uh, this, uh, this shear stress is increased. In fact, this is not the highest, I'm not talking about the coastal zone, I'm talking about zone which are about 90 to 100 meter water depth. And in fact, I don't have the time to show you that, but here we have beautiful migrating dunes up to 12 meters in height, and they are reversing their polarity like tidal dunes. They are not tidal dunes, it's another process I don't have the time to speak about, but they are definitely active bed forms from uh, at the, let's say, uh, yearly scale, time scale. Okay, canyons. Uh, this is the same area again with this nicely uh, incised uh, features here, which represent in fact, the imprint of a direct supply of uh, high density flows from rivers here and then, which are feeding directly the deep sea through these meandering uh, patterns here. And this is the approximate uh, boundary of a, of, a, of a shoreline during the last glacial maximum. The beauty of this, uh, this area is that from this borehole here, we have very precise time constraint. And when I say very precise, I mean at the resolution of uh, Greenland, uh, suborbital uh, climate changes, which are the, the glacial, stadial, and interstadial. This work has been done especially by uh, uh, Paco Ciro from Salamanca, and it provides us especially for the upper uh, part of the borehole. These are about uh, 70 or 70 meters here. So this is the upper part of a deep borehole. We have a fantastic uh, time resolution that we have been using to, to propagate our seismic interpretation to date what is happening into the canyon. 
And at the first look, you can see even better on the multi-channel uh, seismic compared to the chirp, that you have very pronounced uh, seismic reflection like this one, this one here, and this one. And you can see that they are related to the transition between these Heinrich events here and uh, the ensuing uh, warm interstadial. No time to go into the detail, but this is a fantastic uh, uh, clue for having a chronostratigraphic correlation. And this allows us to date the, the last infill of, uh, of a Burkhar Canyon, the, this canyon I showed you previously. And when I say the infill, I'm talking about several hundred meters of uh, sediment infill. And what is quite uh, impressive is that you can see this red surface here, in fact, corresponds to the, to the marine isotope stage five. It's about 130,000 years before present. So all of this has been uh, deposited, in fact, mainly only since this, uh, this surface here, which is, uh, which is correlated to uh, Heinrich uh, Stadial uh, 4, which means about 40,000 years ago. So it allows us to evaluate uh, the accumulation rate, which are just fantastic. And we have different ways to not only to date the, the, the onset of the canyon infill, but we have also ways to, to date the end of this infill, which is uh, in fact post dated by these beach rocks that I showed you previously. So it gives us, because we dated these beach rocks, it gives us a time frame relatively precise. And at this time, we have almost no more sedimentation in the canyon head. So does it mean that there, nothing happens anymore? Not exactly. This is from an overwork done by uh, Mathieu Godin during his PhD. And from this canyon head, always the same place, the same canyon head, we had pl plenty of cores, interface cores and uh, long piston cores. And we had also with our colleagues from uh, Barcelona, we had uh, a tripod measurement here which gave us interesting information about what's presently happening in the, in the canyon head. And these are some of the cores. In fact, the, the one uh, shown in by big yellow circles, we had altogether more than 20 cores, but I showed you here only uh, uh, six of them. And you can see that we have quite a lot of sand. We have up to two meters of sand, sometimes directly outcropping sometimes covered by fluid mud. And what is quite interesting is when you look at the grain size, you see that you have systematically a bimodal uh, distribution, but the, the, the peak, the values of these two modes remains exactly the same, oops. So it means that we have two population of sediment, one are these uh, probably relic sand, which are uh, transported to the, to the upper slope, to the canyon head. And the other, we believe, are these uh, fluid muds that you find also on the shelf during fair weather. And uh, we are able to date or to have a, an idea at least of, a, <clears throat> of the edge of these uh, deposits. And it turns out that most of this is from a geological point of view, quite recent. And when I say quite recent, we have from cesium, uh, we have um, we have very, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, lead to 10, we have, uh, we used, yeah, sorry, we used both cesium and excess uh, lead to 10 to, to, to have an, an estimate of, uh, of the edge of these deposits. So what we find is that, in fact, we have this sand, unit here, which does not represent probably one single event, but pro more probably the amalgamation of several events which took place uh, during the last thousand years and for sure during the, the Holocene based on the underlying uh, deposit that we have been dating through C14. So what 
kind of process can it be? In fact, this is again the cascades I was mentioning uh, that you see from the tripod measurement, you see during this period, which goes from uh, December to, to April, uh, you can see that there are several events, especially one here, where you see that the, the current direction is clearly along the axis of a, of a canyon and you can reach uh, current velocity in the order of 30 to 40 centimeter per second near the bed. Again, the, old, the Burkhar Canyon, I'm sorry, the, the Burkhar Canyon is not the place where you have uh, the strongest uh, uh, cascade event, but this is definitely a cascade which took place during a period of strong wind uh, in this winter period. So we call these kind of deposit cascadites. And the idea is that these cascadites, they represent the amalgamation of sand, which is transported from the shelf edge, from the, the shore face uh, of the last glacial maximum into the canyon edge. How deep they go, I cannot answer right away, but they probably don't go very far in the deep sea. And part of them are uh, concentrating in the canyon heads. So now to finish, uh, I show you this, uh, I show you this uh, sink to source approach, <laughs> but we, we can start from the deep basin and which is going to include quite a lot of uh, new results, uh, not only from, from my group of my, or my colleagues, but uh, it's time I think to, to have a synthesis about uh, the entire system. And in fact, again, this is the map of the Western Mediterranean Sea. And this is a table with uh, the major sediment bodies that we can identify for the last 20,000 years. I'm not going to go into the, the long history of the quaternary uh, around deep sea fan, but we can start with the so-called mega turbidite. This is a huge sediment body, which was first uh, uh, described by uh, colleagues from uh, NOC in, in Britain. Uh, and this uh, mapping, in fact, uh, take into account the, the new finding by, uh, by Cateneo and others who mapped uh, the extension of this uh, huge sediment body. When I say huge, I'm talking about 600 cubic kilometers, which means it's in the same range as most of the huge uh, uh, sediment slides or uh, uh, major sedimentary events which have been uh, identified around the world. And this, uh, this unit, in fact, there are probably several turbidites. In fact, it's not one single event, but now it has been uh, dated very precisely. In fact, there are more cores on the, that, the one presented on this map based on the, on the recent work of Catania and others. And this is the age of this uh, mega turbidite with maybe a S, uh, which is around 22. Uh, 22,000 years before present. And almost at the same time, if we consider the uncertainties uh, related to the dating of such uh, sediment bodies, we have two big, uh, two big uh, mass transport deposits, the Western and Eastern uh, mass, Rhone mass transport deposit, which were known for a long time, let's say from 30 years, but they have been uh, precisely dated uh, only uh, during the last years. And it turns out that both are the same age, uh, around 21.5 years. And again, they put, uh, they, they, re they remobilize a huge amount of sediment uh, largely accumulated. If you remember this place where we had this, uh, thick quaternary accumulation here on the previous slide. We don't know what is the, at the origin of this. Is it due to the salt tectonics, which has been uh, at the origin of mass wasting along the, because we are exactly at the outlet of the Rhone. So you can imagine that during the, the last glacial maximum, a huge amount of unstable sediment was accumulating here 
and maybe this is the cause of this uh, two event. Regarding the, the mega turbidite, uh, I cannot claim that this comes from the Rhone. It might have several sources. In fact, nobody really knows uh, what are the sources. Uh, and it's not so easy to use uh, rare earth or uh, heavy minerals in that particular uh, situation to, to determine the, the provenance of these, uh, of these sediment bodies. Anyway, and now we have something else which has been called the Rhone Neofan or Neo Channel. This is a system, this is a beautiful channel levy system. It is the recent most, I will show you some more views later of this system, which was in place between 21.5. It is overlying the, the mass transport deposit. And now we have pretty precise time constraints about the end of the functioning of this system. It is not Holocene as it was claimed uh, previously, but it stopped functioning around 18.5 thousand years ago. Well, we have quite a lot of sediment uh, trapped also on the, on the shelf. Maybe we have time to see that later on. Uh, in the form of transgressive and high stand deposit during the last 20 years, 20,000 years, and the delta plane, again, which has been evaluated by colleagues from, uh, from X to be about 16 cubic kilometer. You have to think that the, the Rhone uh, was an estuary uh, 10,000 years, let's say 8,000 years ago. You have a, a huge estuary like that, which has been infilled by the by the river during the retreat of the during the sea level rise, uh, thanks to the huge amount of sediment coming from from the Alps. So, to go again to the to go back to the to the deep sea, these are the two major uh, sediment bodies. I, I several times I mentioned the own deep sea fan, but there is another. Uh, not so well-known uh, sediment body, which is the Pyrenee Languedocian sedimentary ridge with uh, beautiful uh, sediment waves, something like three kilometers uh, spaced. And I'm not going to talk about all of these things because we are going to focus on the last 20,000 years. So this is again the, the mass transport deposit uh, of the Western uh, MTD and the Rhone Neofan. And there are very few uh, Holocene deposits, uh, epipelagic, but also some turbiditic uh, deposits which have been identified. But in fact, they are very thin compared to the other sediment bodies. And they mainly come not from the Rhone, but from this uh, canyon system here, as well as the La Fonera Canyon, which comes from the Pyrenees Mountains. So does it mean that nothing happens uh, nowadays in the, in, the, in the deep water? Because I said there is almost no Holocene deposition. Not really. In fact, there are recent results that show us that erosion is taking place. In fact, when you look at the, this uh, shaded bathymetric image uh, with a lot of information that we have no time to look at in detail, but you can see that there are several erosion features, especially in that zone. And again, this is the zone of uh, convection, formation of deep water in the Western Mediterranean. And this is the position of these uh, tripod measurement which are done. They have been published recently uh, by my colleague uh, Xavier Duriot Madron. And what you can see here is that we have episodes of um, of uh, important uh, mixing and uh, dense water formation with current velocities uh, in excess to 40 uh, centimeter per second. So this is an active zone, but not so much uh, preservation to be expected. So let's move a bit further landward to see what's, what's going on with sediments. So we can follow the track of, a, of the active canyon, which in that system, which is the Petit Rhone uh, Canyon. 
And here you can see two seismic profiles here and there, and the position of cores uh, that were taken seven to eight meter long on terraces, which are located within the major canyon. It's a pretty complex uh, morphology, as you can see. So this, uh, these are the rims the, of the, the major rims of the canyon. And in fact, you have uh, uh, a series of uh, terraces. So we chose uh, terraces in intermediate positions. So we may pick uh, the relatively fine grain component of, uh, of a turbidite uh, traveling along the, along the, the canyon, the axial incision of the canyon, in order to, 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 to have access to a relatively continuous uh, record. And this is a quite impressive uh, set of results uh, from uh, Lombo Tombo. He was, a, he was a, a PhD student working mainly with Bernard Denielou at Ifremer. And uh, as you may, as you know, it's not so easy to, to date turbidites. It's quite challenging, in fact. So the approach was to use, uh, the approach was to use uh, indirect way, correlating uh, a reference core, which in fact is coming from the sediment ridge the pyreneo languedocian sediment ridge, which is, uh, I'm sorry, which is situated here, which can be compared very nicely with the uh, Greenland uh, climate record here. So you see a perfect match. So we have, we have some uh, C14 dates for sure. And this is the pyreneo uh, languedocian ridge. And this is another ridge. Uh, from the VAR, uh, situated uh, to the east of, uh, of the Gulf of Lyons, along the French Riviera, to be more precise. And you see that our uh, turbidity cores, the two cores I was presenting before, we can correlate them. We have some, but not so many uh, uh, C14 dates, but the shape can be confidently uh, correlated to these uh, references here. So it allowed uh, Jvesla to, to propose a chronology. What you see here is the number of turbiditic events along, uh, along these two cores, one and two. And what is interesting, and this has been uh, normalized by different methods. And what is interesting is to observe that the, the turbiditic activity again stops around 18.5 uh, thousand years ago. So could it be related to this meltwater pulse, a time when there was a, 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 a relatively abrupt sea level rise? It's not the, the most important one. It's a so-called uh, 19K uh, meltwater pulse. So that is uh, the working hypothesis that at the time of this uh, uh, meltwater pulse, there was a disconnection of, a, of, a Rhone from, of the Rhone River from the canyonade and much uh, lower uh, turbiditic activity. And what is also interesting to observe is that this age is about the same as the one we observed in the other canyon. So no more, no more sediment in the canyon, so we have to move on the shelf. And this is a detailed map of a, of a continental shelf here. And um, with a very narrow spacing of a contour line, which explains some uh, artifacts like this uh, one here, but it gives you a quite beautiful view of a, of a morphology of a shelf. And if we start from the, the story, we, we, we stopped in the canyon head, we are now here on the, on the outer shelf where you can see some remains of shelf edge delta, but most of the sediment has been uh, swept away. So this is, uh, in fact, an erosion surface from the last glacial maximum. And then if you move landward, or I'm sorry, and you can see also early transgressive sand bodies. I mean, sand shorelines or deltas, which have been deposited during the early stages of, uh, of a sea level rise. And then come a time of very rapid uh, very rapid sea level rise, uh, the well-known meltwater pulse uh, 1A, 
And during this time, there is no real time for building a, a Delta X system, but you can track very nicely here, the retreat path of a, of a river, which in fact left a lot of sediment, especially coarse grained uh, sediment. All of these red uh, dots, I, I don't know if you can see them very well. They are, uh, they, most of them very rich, these uh, dark acoustic fascias, and we got uh, pebbles and cobbles uh, at the bottom of the core. So this is obviously the track of a retreat of the, of the own mouth uh, during this meltwater pulse 1A. And then comes a time of slowdown of sea level rise, known as the younger dryest, and it gives time to the Rhone, if I may say, to build a delta X system, and progradation is occurring. All of these things that you see here correspond to this younger dryest uh, system. In fact, it's a bit more complicated because if you look carefully, the edge of this system is getting younger and younger when you move to the west. So the depth of this, uh, of this system here is around 60 meters, and here it's only 40 meters. So in fact, it's an oblique retreat of a, of a, of a round system in relation with, uh, with a relatively slow uh, sea level rise that took place during this time interval. And then, you get uh, several delta E globe like this one, which is, uh, in fact, I said, I used to say the Saint Ferreol, but I'm not for sure anymore. Anyway, it's a, it's a delta E globe, which is no more active. We'll see that on the, on the next slide. And then the shifting of a, of a delta E globe. The end of the story is uh, strongly perturbated by the, by the fact that uh, by anthropic uh, activity, because the, the course of the river has been diverted. So the two last lobes are purely anthropic system. And if you look at the cross section, uh, section across this uh, sedimentary system, there are many uh, nice sediment body that you can uh, identify, starting with this younger dryest, uh, huge uh, uh, accumulation. And what you see here, these are dunes, because in fact, all of this is made of sand. So everywhere where you have sand, you have dunes in this, uh, in this area, due to the relatively high energy. Uh, you can see many other things. You can see, for instance, that this, uh, this uh, law that I call Saint Ferreol, in fact, is no more active. And you can see that it's now experiencing erosion. And at a very small scale, it's uh, something that has been described on the Yangtze uh, system, where the, the former Yangtze Delta is uh, presently a source of sediment. And uh, again, these, uh, these uh, modern Delta, which are obscured uh, by the organic uh, matter and gas. So in summary, we have two different uh, system here. We have uh, this uh, Delta X system here in front of a, of a Rhone Delta. And then to the, way, to the west, we have something different, as I said previously, which correspond to sediment advected uh, by the general circulation uh, and uh, feeding some kind of uh, subaqueous delta. So I show you quickly two cross sections here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, let's say, the, the, Rhone, uh, the Rhone context where we have a very thick, uh, up to 60 meter uh, inner shelf due to the accumulation of uh, sediment directly provided by the Rhone. In fact, all of these muds here are not uh, recent mud. They are, well, they are not so old, but they are the mud uh, which were deposited during the, the sea level rise. And in fact, you can see very clearly that they are presently experiencing erosion. And then uh, there is no uh, sedimentation uh, deeper than something like uh, 80 meter water depth. And to the west, we have this, uh, this kind of uh, sigmoid uh, sediment body, as you, you have seen in many other uh, uh, presentations uh, in, the, in the 
in the Yellow Sea, in the East China Sea, in the Adriatic, etc., you see this uh, the result of this longshore sediment transport, which has been presented by, by Paul and many others, uh, where you have this accumulation of transgressive and high stand deposit, which are plastered along the along the, the coastline. In fact, it's like uh, it's a bit like a shallow water uh, counterite, and you see very clearly that there is no Holocene sedimentation. And even the transgressive deposits are only limited to some dunes, uh, sand waves that I, I showed uh, previously, but it's very minor compared to, uh, to what uh, happened during the, the low stand. And uh, this, is, uh, this is another uh, section across this, uh, let's say, let's call it a shallow water contour, right? This is a recent work uh, with uh, maybe the most beautiful uh, <laughs> uh, age model I ever had on a core because uh, everything uh, fits perfectly, which is not always the case, unfortunately. And you see that we have a perfect record from 10,000 to about zero. We had interface and piston cores at this site, in fact. And we have a full perfect record of the Holocene climate changes uh, during the last, let's say, the 10, 10 last thousand years, which is about uh, the Holocene. And in fact, this is one of the two best uh, climatic records. So on Delta X system, it's quite difficult to obtain, uh, to obtain a continuous record, but in, on this kind of uh, system, we have exactly the same, uh, in fact, the same thing as you may find in some deep water uh, contour, right? You have a continuous, slower, but continuous record uh, of uh, environmental uh, changes. And the rate of sedimentation in the order of one meter per thousand year is not as big as the one in Kenyan, but not so bad. So finally, uh, the conclusion, I don't know if I have to read all of this, but, uh, what I want to, to stress is that, in fact, the key is not necessarily, the present is not necessarily the key to the, what did I say? The past is not the key to the present and the present is not the key to the past. This is what I want to say. Uh, we have, in this particular case of the Gulf of Lions, as many of the margin, we have to take into account the sea level, which remains uh, a dominant, a major controlling factor uh, in the partitioning of sediment into various physiographic domains. As you have seen already, there is almost no net deposition on the outer shelf presently. If you see some recent papers where they provide you with, uh, I'm talking about the Gulf of Lyon, they, they provide you with uh, uh, recent uh, accumulation rate. This is based on short cores uh, on radionuclides, and I think it doesn't give any idea about the long term uh, record. This is mainly temporary uh, deposition, which is going to be reworked at the next uh, major storms. So the bypass to the deep sea. Uh, in the case of the Gulf of Lyon is mainly occurring. Uh, in the western part of the Gulf of Lyons, and it's a source of sediment for the deep sea, but relatively minor compared to what happened to during the, the low stern at the time of direct connection. And in fact, what we find in the Gulf of Lyon is that the, the general concept of sequence stratigraphy worked very well. You know, uh, sequence stratigraphy has been such a, a revolution for sedimentary geology that many people try to to demonstrate, but it didn't work. This is what happened with any uh, scientific finding. But personally, I think it works not so bad. And especially uh, if you consider a recent paper, for instance, by Kovo, where they, they present the Rhone as a transgressive uh, system, it's totally wrong. The Rhone is not a transgressive system, uh, the Rhone deep sea fan. The Rhone deep sea fan was built during phases of low sea level and you see that as soon as you switch off the connection between the river and the canyon uh, sediment supply is almost nothing <clears throat> so again 
lot of sediment is supplied by advection to the deep sea only in the western part. So we have a very marked difference between present day situation and what happened during the low stand. And this is my final conclusion. Thank you. Oh, Serge, thank you. Thank you very much to give us a, such a comprehensive review and about the, the, the works in Gulf of Lyon and particularly the, uh, the Rand River derived sediment to, to the shelf, to the canyon, all the way from the stage five, stage three, particularly uh, since the last LGM, you know, how the sea level rise with the transgressive and all the way to high stand, the interaction and the sequence stratigraphy record. Very, very good. If you have any question, you can unmute yourself, you can ask. And so when we're waiting the audience to prepare that question, Serge, I have a question. Looks like if you look at your slide 43, 42 or something, or 44, you know, it show the Holocene, the Holocene, uh, yes, uh, uh, here. If you look at the, you know, near shore from the river mouth all the way to the edge of the mud, only like 20 to 30, less 25 kilometers based on this profile. You know, this is a five kilometers far. So the modern mud, the Holocene, cross shelf only about 25 kilometers maybe. The very narrow mud belt. And also you demonstrate inside the canyon, there's not too much modern sediment. But in some place, you, we see that 20 centimeters of flu mud, right? That 20 centimeters flu mud, do you think it's from the river or you know, through the positive buoyancy transport or through the local resuspension, you know, the canyon, uh, the bank resuspension <coughs> coming to the canyon? Yeah, definitely from the river, from the Rhone River, probably. Uh -huh. uh, there are many. Uh, many experiments. I didn't show that uh, because <laughs> it was already too long, but there are uh, many experiments using uh, gliders, especially yeah. uh, by my colleague at Sefrem, showing that uh, benthic boundary uh, layers, uh, fluid mud is traveling across the shelf. Uh -huh. Yeah. And this is episodically uh, resuspended during uh, during this kind of uh, event. In fact, we we are able to distinguish between what we call the the dry storms uh -huh. and the wet storm. The wet storms are the one going together with floods of the um, of the Rhone River, and uh -huh. uh, there was a big one in two thousand four, for instance. So there were a lot of uh, measurements about the, the behavior of this uh, fluid mud. And then this fluid mud is resting on the, on the shelf or part of it is resting on the shelf for some, some time. And then when you have this extreme event, it will be remobilized I and okay. transported, uh, which is in fact something uh, quite usual on many uh, continental margins around the world, but this has been Precisely uh, monitored by uh, by my colleagues uh, at Sefrem. Yeah, very very good. You know, uh, uh, look at thank you. Pre give us this. Uh, you know, like all those profile and your interpretation make me rethink about what we have in the East China Sea, South China Sea of the Mekong. Mm -hmm. Even our recent work, as you know, in of the Irrawaddy. Some maybe we need to reinterpret. And I think yours is very good. And actually, this profile, this record is kind of a typical record in a river dominated model. You know, it's just, a, just the same, you know, kind of record. That's, that's, that's very good. Um, yes. any, any question from our, our audience? Please go ahead and mute yourself and ask or type your question any, anyway. Anybody? Yoshi. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sash. Hi, Yoshi. How are you going? Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. So wonderful talk. So uh, I, I, I enjoy so much. So I have two questions. The one is, uh, is any sedimentary strata onshore 
uh, MYX5. I'm sorry, what, uh, what, what, the, what's the uh, end of your question? Why there is no what? Uh, is any uh, sedimentary strata onshore uh, MYX5? Cast integration, marine sediments near the onshore? Um, you mean, are you talking about marine stage five? Yeah. yeah onshore. Yeah. Onshore. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> would you like to start a, a cooperation on that? <laughs> we have few uh, deposits uh, which were tentatively uh, assigned to stage five uh, 20 years ago in a time when uh, dating techniques were not so precise and not far from my, from my place, not far from uh, Perpignan. And uh, probably it might be the time to, to go back because now uh, we have much better technologies for dating these, uh, these uh, olites because they are olites. Mm -hmm. This is my colleague uh, Barusso who worked on that. And uh, the, their elevation is uh, a few meters about, uh, I don't want to say something wrong, but they are a few meters above present sea level. Yeah. Okay, and the uh, uh, second question is, uh, it looks like there are three depot centers. One is a delta near shore. Another one yes. is a shelf, the shelf margin deltas, the making the uh, shelf and the upper slope areas. And yes. the deep part. How, how do you think the populations ratio of the three parts? It looks like mostly uh, more than 90% of sediment deposit the deep sea part. Yes. Yeah. How do you think the three? Okay. Yes, it's in fact, uh, yes, you're right. The most of the sediment <laughs> in the Gulf of Lyon and probably elsewhere, except maybe in the East China Sea, is going to the deep sea. And you're right that the, the place where we have the highest uh, accumulation of sediment, I have this opaque map, but I cannot show you them right now. Uh, the, the, it's quite easy to explain that we have pretty good uh, preservation at the shelf edge. This is a place on the margin where we have the highest uh, accommodation. We have a subsidence rate, maybe I said, I don't know. It's in the order of 240 meter per million year, which is quite a lot. And this is why you have, in fact, if you look at these uh, surfaces, they are tilting. They are, they are tilting and this is the place where you have the best accommodation and in fact the, the it's it is changing from the west to the east and this place here is the place where we have the highest subsidence and the best uh, preservation but definitely the, the highest uh, uh, accumulation at the scale of a quaternary is in the deep water mm. yeah Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else? Cool. Yeah, I would like. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Sergio. Thank very, you. very uh, nice talker and very in informative uh, lecture. Yeah, you have very high resolution seismic profile data and very nice interpretation. You mentioned uh, the first question. You mentioned there's two depositional center before the Pleistocene, and one located in the inner shelf, and another moved to the, the later Pliocene, moved to shelf margin. What kind of mechanics? Uh, what kind of mechanism control this dep depositional center? Uh, 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 filter. Okay, uh, this yeah, is yeah. The, is it this the slide one. you are you are referring to, Daido? Yes. So, yeah. what kind of mechanism control this kind of uh, movement, filter yeah. from the inner shelf to the outer shelf? Yes. This is this is the you are talking about the Pliocene, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, this is, I think it's a beautiful illustration. Thanks to the Messinian uh, salinity crisis, we can, uh, we can understand how a margin is, uh, is rebuilt and how much time it takes for a margin to rebuild. So in fact, 
if you go into the detail, this, what you see here is first, it, you are infilling the, all the erosion, uh, erosion, uh, erosional features created by the, during the Messinian crisis. And then you have a progression. I could have calculated, in fact, it, the problem is that the time constraints are, so, are not so good, you know. Even this, uh, this surface here uh, is uh, quite approximate, but we could evaluate the, the migration rate of a, of a shelf edge, you know, of the off-lap break, if you prefer. Uh, and so this is the fact that the, the, the depot center is migrating to the, to the east. It's simply a, a beautiful illustration of a, of a concept of accommodation. Uh, in fact, the margin uh, at the beginning of the Pliocene was pretty strange because you had you had some kind of shelf here, and then you have the shelf break. In fact, was situated uh, just right southeast of this line here, like that. Unfortunately, the, the lines uh, stop here. But you have to imagine a, a stepped continental margin, and what you see here is the reconstruction of this margin, which took about three, four million years, up to five, we may say. And, and this is why I think you have not so much uh, Pliocene sediment on the Rhone deep sea fan, in fact, because uh, at that time, most of the sediment was trapped uh, in the Rhone uh, Valley and on the, on the former shelf in the Gulf of Lyons. It's only around the quaternary that the, that the, the, the system was able to, to connect to the deep sea through a, a well, well formed uh, canyon system. Yeah, uh, thanks. And the second question, uh, how about the quaternary? Yeah, you have very detailed uh, interpretation of uh, quaternary uh, uh, sequence, uh, uh, yeah, sequence uh, uh, strata. And how about the dating methodology just based on the oxygen as a total curve? No, no, we had a real uh, complete, uh, let me see if, uh, yeah. Okay, I okay. just want to find, oops, okay. I'm going to show you one of the many slides I didn't show. <laughs> In fact, we had, a, we had a full set of proxies uh, on, the, on the deep borehole. If I may find the, the good slide. And this include this includes oxygen. In fact, the, the, the best proxy was not, is it okay? Do you see my, my slide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the deep borehole, which, as I said, uh, reaches, uh, uh, reaches uh, stage 13 here. And in fact, uh, this, is the, this is an old slide that I did right after the project, and it is based only on the, on the secular variation of the magnetic field and on the grain size, uh, the sand fraction. And just based on that, we are able to, to propose an age model that you can wow. see here. There were some questions about this, but we had, let's say, a pretty good age model. And then came the oxygen isotopes. And then, and this is a paper, a really nice paper. In fact, it was submitted to Nature by Paco Sierra, and, but it was uh, rejected, which is a pity. But uh, in this paper, Paco Sierra was explaining how we can use these various proxies, including the grain size, uh, as a proxy of climate changes. And it's a pretty long story. I don't know if I have the time to go into the detail. For instance, here, what you can see are the three pikes of stage five. As you may know, there are three warm interval during stage five and you can recognize them very nicely. Very and then Paco went into the detail on the upper uh, zone. And as I said, it is this uh, incredible correlation at the scale of uh, glacial, stadial, interstadial from Greenland. And it works 
perfectly. It works perfectly. So, so nobody so was Serge, expecting something like that, in fact. So, Serge, on, on your left, the seismic profile, which yes. kind of profile? Is this Sparker or this is Ergon? Uh, this is Sparker. This is Sparker, oh. but in fact, it works pretty well also on the on the on the air gun. It's a small air gun. Uh, we yeah, it's yeah. called a, a mini GI gun. Yeah, mini GI. And, um, it's amazing! Look at your profile. It's so clear. That's super high resolution. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> uh, something we never did, and we should have done, is uh, to perform some kind of spectral analysis. Uh, on this kind of data. In fact, uh, a young fellow did this recently uh, in in Belgium. Uh, he, he did that on the on the Alboran Sea, and he, he was pretty successful. He, he, we had this idea twenty years ago. No, not twenty. Uh, Fifteen years ago, but we never did. Yeah, we need more students. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should not complain. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's that's very. Very, very nice. Uh, anybody a question? So I have another quick question. How about the current, the delta, the shoreline? Is also erosion or also retreat? I know there's mm -hmm. many, you know, the step dams. You know, I remember in a classroom, we talk about the so many dams all the way from uh, uh, Switzerland, you know, they build that kind of step dams coming down here. So I guess the, sediment discharge also decreased sharply. You are right. In fact, uh, as you may know, this part of the Mediterranean Sea is pretty, uh, is pretty touristic and coastal erosion is, uh, is a major issue yeah. 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 in the Gulf of Lyons. And in fact, I had, uh, we had some uh, funding <laughs> to valorize our data uh, for um, uh, a project uh, it was a European funded project called BeachMed and the objective was to, to, to have an evaluation about the impact of sand mining, offshore sand mining uh, to refurbish beaches because there is a, a, a strong coastal retreat in some parts of the Gulf of Lyons and there are many uh, resorts uh, along, all along the coast, not only in France, but also in Spain and Italy, which are under the threat of uh, the, sea, the global sea level rise, which is in the Mediter in this part of the Mediterranean Sea, it's about uh, three, three, four millimeter per year, same as, uh, as the global rise. So this is, a, this is a key issue. In fact, I have some uh, colleagues uh, at CEFREM, uh, Nicolas Robin and Raphael Serta, working on that. And uh, they have been doing a lot of detailed studies. In fact, the, it's very changing from one place to the other one. It strongly depends upon the, the, the infralitoral prism, the, the availabil availability of sand uh, in the coastal zone, which is very uh, changing from one place to the other one. Yeah. I see. I see. King, you have a question or comments? Yeah, okay. Well, Josh, it's, thank you very much. It's a very nice talk. But I have a, a, a small question about the situation of uh, the sediment discharge of the Horn River, the present situation. Are there a lot of um, bad load? I mean, the coarse uh, materials uh, from the Horn River now or mainly suspended sediment discharge? Uh, that's, uh, that's an important question. I cannot give you uh, a precise answer. I can tell you that yes, there is some. Uh, I'm trying to find, but anyway, I don't have. Uh, uh, I don't have. Uh, sorry. Anyway, um, very sand for sure exported to the to the sea. And why I'm saying that, but I don't have a slide, unfortunately, is that there are dunes at the at the outlet of the uh, of the Rhone. In fact, I have. Mm -hmm. Let me show you this one here. Uh, this, is the, this is a map that we did some years ago. So it has been changing. This is the active uh, Delta X system. It is called Roustan. It, it is about 
100 year old. And we surveyed with my Ifremer colleagues and uh, Claude Vela at uh, Serej, we surveyed this. Uh, this is quite dangerous here because it's a very shallow water area. But all of this part here has been surveyed and it's filled with uh, dunes, sand waves. So oh. obviously there is a sand uh, export. Uh, I have read some numbers, but I don't know how reliable they are. It's, monitoring of sand transport is not that easy as you may know better than me, but the, mm -hmm. uh, I, the numbers I read were in the order of one or two million tons per year, which is not so much compared to Asian systems. Mm. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. You know, I was also suggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, watch the Wednesday Mid Allison talk. Mid Allison talk about the Mississippi River, particularly the sand portion, how much reach to the ocean. I think it, his study is uh, is good for us to reference, and uh, it's uh, it's very good. But anyway, um, I think uh, thank you all of you. And uh, so uh, uh, one thing I want to do a little bit advertisement. Uh, this coming next Wednesday, because we're supposed to other professor give a talk, but uh, something happened and uh, I had to fill in the gap. So I will talk a little bit about the Irrawaddy River Delta. And, uh, and also uh, Friday, next Friday, we have a talk and uh, uh, he will talk about the coastal marshland and the delta with the impact of accelerated sea level rise. I think very interesting talk. So uh, mark your calendar and come back next uh, next week. So other than that, I think uh, thank you so much. Thank you Yoshi already after the middle night and thank you staying with us every time. And thank you for our Chinese colleague already 11.30. And so, uh, so uh, I'll see you next week, okay. Serge, okay. thank you very much, Serge. Yeah, thank you, thank Serge. You. Thank you, Serge. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Also, for... Serge, yeah, you can thank share you. The, some part yeah, of your PowerPoint you. so I can, you know, share with the, the student, a colleague. Okay. Sure. Wonderful.